Thank you all so much for being here uh, this morning or this evening, wherever you find yourself. Uh, we're very excited to have you all here. This is part of the Campbell Collaborations um, webinar series. And today we have a really um, interesting talk from members of our information retrieval methods group related to evidence synthesis methods in uh, the business and management uh, area. So today our speakers are um, Ryan Splenda. Ryan is the business and economics librarian for uh, Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. He liaises to the Tepper School of Business and um, as well as uh, Carnegie Mellon's University Advancement. Uh, he, for over five years, has provided research, teaching, and information support to the faculty, staff, and students of these units. And his research interests include the evaluation and usage of private equity and venture capital data sources, as well as expanding evidence synthesis methods such as systematic reviews within the fields of business librarianship and business and management uh, as well. Um, our second speaker of the day will be Cosette Comer. Cosette is the Evidence Synthesis Services Coordinator at the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. She specializes in evidence synthesis review methods, um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, uh, as well as comprehensive search design, formal critical appraisal of research, as well as methods and tools for large review management. In her daily work, she consults with and mentors researchers and students on evidence synthesis methods and supports relevant skills such as comprehensive search design and critical appraisal. She also partners with research teams as an expert uh, on their evidence synthesis reviews and pursues research focused on other areas of meta science, such as replication and reproducibility. Uh, Cosette is also the library liaison to the statistics and mathematics departments and the computational modeling and data analytics degree program, as well as the Center for Biostatistics and Health Data Science. Um, also contributing to the presentation today, but not presenting is Kate Nyhan. Kate is a research and education librarian for public health at the Cushing Whitney Medical Library uh, and a lecturer in environmental health sciences at Yale School of Public Health. She earned a post-master's certificate as an interprofessional informationist at Simmons University School of Library and Information Sciences. And Kate is an information expert. She contributes to evidence synthesis and meta research projects. Um, her research interests include research waste, reproducibility, reporting, and the information behavior of the public health workforce. Um, I will also introduce myself. I'm Sarah Young. I am a librarian at, also at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries and one of the co-conveners of the Information Retrieval Methods Group for the Campbell Collaboration. Um, so I'm happy to be here as your moderator today. Um, we're gonna go ahead and dive into presentations and at the very end, we'll take questions. So any questions you have, please do put them into the Zoom chat. Um, feel free to put them there as you think of them and we will go ahead and get to those um, after Ryan and Cosette have presented. And I also just wanna to call to your attention that um, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on um, the Campbell Collaborations webinar um, website. So with that, um, welcome. Ryan and Cosette, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, for Campbell. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today, wherever you may be. Um, we did slightly change the title a little bit, so um, apologies for that. Uh, we are going to be talking about evidence synthesis and information retrieval and commonalities across disciplines, and we're going to be kind of using business as a case study, since that's the world that I live in primarily. Um, so, yes. Uh, we want to go ahead and proceed, Cosette, to the next slide. Um, Sarah did a wonderful job um, uh, uh, presenting who we are, but here's some lovely pictures to go along with our titles as well. <clears throat> and then um, we also did want to remind some folks about some technical notes. So again, just to reemphasize that this webinar is being re recorded, it will be available on the Campbell uh, 
collaboration YouTube channel uh, for posterity's sake. And uh, we do ask that you please use the chat box to ask questions during the presentation. We're hoping that we will wrap up our portion within 45 to 50 minutes. Sometimes I talk too long, so I apologize in advance for that. Uh, but we should have some time at the end for a Q&A. Uh, and one more technical note. Uh, I, we did want to let you know that the um, closed caption recordings are also available to you if you would like. Um, you can use the show caption feature in, within Zoom if you would like to do that. So at this time, uh, before we pr proceed any further, we did want to uh, launch a poll and ask uh, all of the attendees a particular question. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. Can everyone see this? Um, the question is, is it acceptable to do a systematic review of papers published in your top 20 disciplinary journals? You can only choose one choice, and your choices are no, never, maybe depending on the discipline, uh, and yes, always. So let's take a, a minute or so and uh, answer these questions here. We will revisit this uh, as well at the end of the presentation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll, and then we will. Um, continue at this point in time. Okay, so uh, some learning objectives. Overarchingly, we are uh, going to be talking about, uh, we want you to consider some of the similarities and methodological approaches and resources across various disciplines. Um, Next, we want to talk about recognizing evidence synthesis methodological, method, methodological requirements, fun word, uh, across different disciplines as well. Uh, and then um, I'm going to be doing a deeper dive into, um, whoops, sorry about that, folks, a deeper dive into identifying resources to consult and search for very specific disciplinary research questions. We're going to do a deep dive into disciplinary uh, resources. We've selected a handful uh, with, again, a particular focus on business and management. And then last but not least, um, uh, the, we'll discuss some norms in various disciplines uh, that probably stretch across different disciplines as well uh, that may conflict with standards in evidence synthesis methods. So those are our learning objectives. Our agenda is going to follow that pretty closely uh, as well. Okay. Well, let's begin. So we're going to start by sort of setting the stage by providing a quick overview and some background on what are the purpose? Why are we here? <laughs> what is the purpose of evidence synthesis projects? And um, some of us may know this, but it's always good, you know, to sort of re-remember re or revisit why we, why we do what we do, right? Um, so the purpose, there's a handful of purposes, but primarily our, we want to reduce the risk of bias uh, in, in our search results um, by taking a look at all the possible evidence that's out there. And of course, evidence synthesis projects, we want to address real life problems. And a lot of times these problems do have an interdisciplinary focus, which is kind of great because we will, we will be affecting hopefully positive change across a variety of different perspectives and area. And of course, to inform the decision-making process uh, at various policy um, um, level levels, if we will. Now, because research is both specialized and, and narrow and increasingly a lot of times interdisciplinary, we want to think, therefore, outside of the box a little bit, sort of broaden the search approach to find studies. And that's what we're going to try and, and dive into a little bit today as well. Um, and the good news is, as we will later show, evidence synthesis projects are gaining in popularity across a variety of dif disciplines. So yay to that. So with that background in mind, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Cosette. She's going to talk about the methodological similarities in, across disciplinaries and evidence synthesis requir requirements. Cosette. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction as well. And I just want to add that one uh, one thing that didn't make it into my little uh, bio, bio was that in our university, we support from our evidence synthesis services, all disciplines, which is putting us into a really unique position uh, that comes with both a lot of opportunities and challenges. But that's part of why I'm so interested in talking about the similarities across disciplines uh, and those really core evidence synthesis requirements that we'll discuss today. Um, as Ryan kind of already 
laid out the foundation for. Uh, one way that I like to think and position the evidence synthesis methods, think about and position the evidence synthesis methods uh, is through the why, uh, the so what, um, what this is really trying to get at is uh, an overall translation of knowledge, a translation of evidence and research uh, into action. And so I'm using this Graham 2006 You've probably seen uh, this this graphic um, to highlight that knowledge synthesis is at the uh, literal center uh, in this image, but also is definitely um, a, a foundational aspect of the knowledge to action process. Again, these types of reviews are really intended to inform practice, to inform policy and decision making, to take a bunch of disparate studies and findings and information that is available to answer a question and make it something that can be actionable. Um, with that background in mind, I also think it's really important to have some foundational knowledge about the history of evidence synthesis. It's despite being uh, surging in this time, um, it is not necessarily a new concept in of itself. Oftentimes, James Lind is uh, credited with conducting the first systematic review on scurvy. Um, and, if, and so he took uh, not only his, uh, 50 years or so uh, to document on his ship, what was happening with scurvy, why it was happening, what types of uh, interventions could reduce the, um, the negative effects of scurvy. But he was also reaching out to other ship doctors and figuring out what is happening across the board. And if you think about scurvy, this is one of those, uh, those medical situations that we feel pretty confident uh, as a society, typically, that uh, we know how to treat it, what it st uh, stems from, and, and uh, that's a pretty incredible uh, illustration of the power of systematic reviews or evidence synthesis more broadly. We're also seeing in this time frame, the 1750s to the 1950s, very broad time frame, um, that we have some calls from some really big medical associations for a deliberate synthesis uh, or a deliberate effort to synthesize evidence uh, for more meaningful practice um, and some applications to medical areas, uh, medical fields of study. But also something that's important when we think about the timeline and the history of evidence synthesis is that it's not exclusive to health uh, and medicine. Uh, in, in this broad time range, we are also seeing uh, some applications in astronomy and agricultural sciences. In the 1970s, this was what I would kind of conceptualize as the first big boom of uh, evidence synthesis. We have Jean Glass, who is a social science education researcher, uh, coining the term meta-analysis uh, to describe the synthesis of quantitative studies across uh, different uh, uh, the findings of different studies. Um, to inform practice. Uh, and this is also in the 70s, we're seeing Archie Cochran start to apply this work in his, uh, this approach in his own work successfully with the um, exploration of aspirin to reduce heart, uh, heart attack recurrence. Um, and then looking forward into the 1990s to the 2020s time range, the more modern time range, we're seeing the emergence of specific collaborations meant to uh, help uh, folks do evidence synthesis and do it well. Um, that's, of course, the Cochrane collaboration, uh, the Campbell collaboration, uh, which we've highlighted here because that is for uh, the, the group that we were presenting on behalf of today, um, that took a more social sciences uh, approach to, to some topics, some overlapping with health and some overlapping with more policy related areas. Uh, this is also the, around the time frame that Ray Pawson comes up with his realist review synthesis method, which is intended for complex policy interventions. Grant and Booth published their infamous uh, typology of reviews, which I'm sure everyone here has read. And if you haven't, uh, you should. And there is a 2019 version as well. Um, and then the uh, collaboration of environmental evidence also comes out in the early 2010s timeframe. And so the point again of this slide is really to articulate that yes, we see a lot of blue, which represents that kind of health sciences background, but there's also a lot going on in other fields. And I, I like especially being positioned in my own career as a, a 
interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary service, I really like to emphasize that we're not uh, trying to take a, a method that is exclusive to health sciences and medicine and apply it uh, indiscriminately to another field. Rather, we're taking principles that have been applied across different fields uh, for this overall knowledge translation uh, approach um, uh, to inform practice and policy. So with that in mind, I think it's really helpful to kind of take a look at some of these three uh, point places for collaborations across different disciplines, Campbell, the collaboration for environmental evidence and Cochrane. And we can see just by pulling a couple of sentences from their, uh, their methodological guidelines that we have a lot of commonalities. We're seeing a clear criteria for eligibility, cri oops, for eligibility, of the research that you include explicit and comprehensive search strategies, replicable coding and analysis, and an integrative uh, summary of findings. We're seeing predefined methods, specific questions, unbiased manners of conduct, and so on. But this is obviously not a great, uh, just taking two sentences or one sentence from each of these methodological guidelines isn't sufficient. Um, those are really heavy uh, reads. So of course, I encourage you, if you are going to conduct a review with Campbell, please do read the Campbell uh, methodological guidelines before you proceed. Um, but know that there are some underpinning characteristics of systematic reviews and other evidence synthesis uh, across these disciplines and across the field more broadly. Um, that is that these uh, types of reviews are intended to be applicable. We want to be answering a specific research question, especially if you're doing a systematic review. Your research question might be a little broader for an evidence gap map or a scoping or a mapping review. Um, but in any case, you're going to have a clearly defined scope defined before you actually start the review. And you want to make sure you're not duplicating efforts. The reduction of bias is also a really important aspect of the systematic review and evidence synthesis methods, broadly speaking. Um, it's one of those things that really distinguishes it from a traditional literature review approach. And this is achieved through several steps. Uh, we're looking at a predefined protocol that's ideally piloted and registered ahead of time. We're looking at two reviewers uh, to review at uh, all of the stages of the review, ideally, um, and having a predefined process for uh, coming to consensus when there are disagreements among the reviewers. We also, for a systematic review or a meta-analysis, we need to be conducting a critical appraisal of all relevant included studies. Uh, and then ideally, uh, this is something, the, the assessment of evidence is something that we see often in health and medicine, but is something that I think we need to, to uh, discuss more often in general. It is um, a reflection of what you've done and an evaluation of how reliable the evidence you purport is for actually informing decision making. Um, again, we're looking at a consideration of all available evidence. That means that our search really should be done in more than one place. And so you might be thinking about the poll that we took earlier. Um, we also want to be making sure that we are looking at uh, or considering the relevance of potentially looking at gray literature. Um, and there are additional methods like reaching out to experts in the field and um, doing citation chaining. Finally, but also very important, the replicability of the review itself is an ideal of a systematic review in contrast to your literature reviews, your traditional literature reviews. This means detailed process documentation, a transparent report of all the decision making uh, that occurs, um, and then ensuring that your material is subsequently open, uh, openly accessible and shareable. Um, with this in mind, so those foundations are, are key. Uh, so let's take a look at what the process itself is, um, is going to look like. And this is going to be pretty much standard across your disciplines. Um, no matter what you're doing, uh, even if you do a review in the same discipline for, for your entire research career, um, your reviews are always going to look a little different from one another because the review itself, all those nuances and details are going to be informed by your research question, your goals, what you aim to achieve by doing this review, and your eligibility criteria that further describes that scope. Um, but in any case, you're going to be looking in for your search, you're going to be looking in academic databases at a minimum. Um, we want this process to be systematic, 
and replicable, transparently reported, et cetera. But we also might want to consider, depending on the research question, uh, doing web searches, uh, reaching out to experts in the field, looking at the work cited uh, and the work that has cited all of your relevant material. That's also what we call citation chasing. And uh, considering gray literature like policy documents or um, white papers and other material that isn't the traditional act, that isn't going to necessarily be stored in the traditional academic databases. Where you search is very broadly speaking, uh, just wherever you can find answers to your questions. Um, now, of course, we do have to put some barriers around that for practical purposes, um, but this should be the driving motivation for where you've chosen to search. You should also always consider looking in some interdisciplinary databases. Web of Science core collection has both STEM heavy fields, uh, but also represents some so the social science index. Um, we also would encourage folks to consider using Scopus and or Dimensions, depending on the availability at your institution. Um, between this step, you're going to be downloading all of your, your references from those academic databases or those other spaces that, you're, uh, that you have searched. Uh, and you're going to be reviewing that material outside of the databases themselves for consistency and uh, to make sure that every step can be as transparent as possible. You can do this in a citation manager, maybe a spreadsheet software, but I would highly recommend if you are planning on pursuing a full systematic review or evidence gap map using some kind of systematic review software. The selection process should be systematic, consistent, and replicable, as should all of these stages. They should have at least two you should have two reviewers independently reviewing all unique ref references for relevance as defined by your predefined eligibility criteria. And this often takes place via two stages, a screening of title and abstract and a full text review. We are then looking at an appraisal if you are doing a systematic review or a meta-analysis. This is a required step. Again, systematic, consistent, and replicable ideally with two independent appraisers, and we should be looking for risk of bias based on the research design of your included studies, but there might also be some additional characteristics that you should take into consideration based on your topic. Finally, the probably uh, most ambiguous when you're, when you're looking at the overall process for is data extraction, because this is really driven by whatever you plan to synthesize. You really need to have, um, at a minimum, your study characteristics, uh, but, but ultimately what you extract will depend on, again, that research question and the goals of your review. And again, you just want to be transparent about what you sought to find, what you actually found from each of your articles, and what you're reporting and using in your synthesis. That brings us to this end piece here. We've got the qualitative synthesis method and the meta-analysis. Now, one thing that I've seen uh, often in my career is that when we get to the synthesis portion, there's already been so much work that has gone into it that it can be challenging for folks to know exactly how to approach a narrative sort of report on, on um, what they found. Uh, so looking at Campbell's reporting guidelines, we can see that they actually have in their as a mandatory aspect in the protocol, um, especially if you're not pursuing a meta-analysis, you should plan the specific methods that you'll use to narratively synthesize the results of included studies. They also identify uh, as highly desirable, talking about study quality and how that informs the synthesis, whether qualitative or quantitative. Um, and the the Campbell collaboration also uses uh, and refers to often the Cochrane Handbook, so we can peek at that as well, take a look at that um, as a resource here too. So we're seeing that the uh, synthesis, we want to include uh, a synthesis of study characteristics and maybe statistical syntheses, uh, just looking into chapter 21, which is focused really on the qualitative evidence um, aspect of, of reviews. They mentioned that you can integrate this with a traditional intervention or uh, review um, using a mixed methods design. And uh, they even mentioned in the same chapter, chapter 21, some of the common synthesis approaches for qualitative evidence. So in short, I know this was a lot of information, but in short, the uh, evidence synthesis methods 
can be applied to most disciplines. I, I hesitate to say all, but I, there, there are, uh, there's a lot of rel relevance across disciplines and um, the systematic review methods can inform, highly inform these phases. And uh, you might pull from other resources to inform the qualitative synthesis methods as well. Um, so with that, we're gonna focus in on business management and I'll pass back over to Ryan. Awesome. So uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about some disciplinary resources. We're going to highlight some specialized uh, resources to, to find, uh, focus in on the search um, section here, where to find potential articles and studies of relevance, both from the disciplinary perspective, interdisciplinary perspective, as well as a, a ton of different gray source, gray literature options as well. But before we do that, Cosette, if you will, um, we did want to set the stage. I did want to set the stage uh, and present to you just a quick little chart um, that sort of highlights the different evidence synthesis papers that are being published by subject area. So this data comes from the Scopus database. And what I basically did was run a title search. It's not very precise, but the idea was to get at systematic scoping or rapid reviews in the title. And I limited the, in the, the publication date range from tw uh, 2018 to 2022. For some reason, I decided not to include 2023 because we're not fully through that year yet, as you'll see why in a second here. Uh, but the goal is to show that there is definitely uh, a ton of different disciplinary areas that are publishing these types of evidence synthesis projects across different disciplines. If you will, Cosette, go ahead. And you were wondering, well, where is business and management on this list? Because it's not in the pie, ch pie chart here. Well, it's because it only makes up 2.1% uh, of the total articles that were uh, searched for uh, in Scopus. However, that does translate to 4,200 um, specific studies. So there's a lot of, of, of published research in the ES uh, area here. Okay, a deeper dive into business and management um, shows that over the past five or six years, it has grown exponentially. Uh, in fact, since we are talking about business and business is all about the numbers, there's a 296% increase in published uh, evidence synthesis projects from 2018 to 2022 over the year. So just to give you an idea of, of where we are from that pers particular perspective. Okay, Cosette, go ahead. So first we're gonna talk about where to search. Uh, and then I'm gonna get in a little bit into the weeds of, of, of how to search specific um, uh, disciplinary resources with an emphasis on business and management. So generally speaking, and this will be sort of the case across uh, all disciplinary areas, uh, and Cosette touched upon this a little bit. We want um, to to start our search in in, a, in in at least three different places. And of course, this is all going to depend on the nature of your research question. You're going to hear me say that probably multiple different times. That is going to drive you know uh, the methodological approach to all of these. But we do want to generally start within discipline-specific bibliographic databases, interdisciplinary bibliographic databases, as well as a variety of gray literature resources. Um, and then we do wanna think about, okay, from sort of like the gray literature perspective, where would research on your topic be published? Now, so this could be things like various governmental research agencies and you know the, the, the publication efforts that, that they employ various think tanks or policy research institutes. There's a ton of different working paper repositories that are both disciplinary specific, but also interdisciplinary as well. And then potentially, you know, con conference archive sites that are not possibly not indexed in various databases. And I would include in this as well, potential journals that are, are, are not. Um, this is gonna show up from time to time in different disciplines. So, and again, the nature of the research question will not only determine how many resources you consult, but how many possible crossover disciplinary resources you will consult as well. Go ahead, Cosette. So before we do sort of a deep dive of where to search by discipline, I did wanna briefly touch upon an interesting point uh, that was brought up 
uh, in our discussions about uh, interdisciplinary databases. So um, the question of interest here that came about um, is, is it reasonable to use disciplinary filters that are built into the large interdisciplinary databases? So the Scopus is the web of sciences of the world in an evidence synthesis search. Since these are built in options within these resources to help limit or narrow results as well as target results to specific disciplinary areas. I personally generally lean towards no because there is the possibility of leaving out potentially relevant studies that are uh, relevant to your research question of interest. Uh, also, if the research question is interdisciplinary in nature, this sort of could defeat the purpose to some degree. Um, there's always the possibility that uh, filters are never 100% perfect within these various resources. That's a catch-22 and from a multiple different perspectives. So my opinion is I would generally lean towards no, and I will invite Cosette to also um, jump in with her thoughts as well. But what was interesting was one of our colleagues, Kate, who is um, one of our, helped de develop this presentation with us, pinpointed a very interesting example. So here, here's that pretty much in a nutshell. Um, there was work done on a sexual violence, sexual abuse study, um, and it's pretty much almost impossible to do a, uh, a search within this topic without using the keyword or the, or the term of rape um, when investigating this question. But it turns out that there's a very specific plant um, called the rape seed, also called rape or oil seed rape, um, that has a high amount of uric acid within it. So it turns out there's a pretty decent amount of literature on this topic within the agriculture discipline. So when you're searching, doing the search within a, a large inter interdisciplinary database like a Scopus or Web of Science, it may actually be reasonable to run your search, make sure the term is included as a part of the search, but possibly leave out or, or filter out um, results from the agriculture perspective, because most likely those are all studies that present a lot of noise within the actual question that we're trying to research here. So uh, again, maybe not a perfect answer to this question, but an interesting discussion point that we did want to highlight. Cosette, did you have any thoughts on this or are we pretty much okay on this? Just I completely agree with you. I think that when you can, uh, avoid using actually in general I try to avoid using built-in fi filters um, but because again filters aren't perfect uh, there is a backlog of material that has not been processed and the newer material might get missed by filtering out uh, like that um, but I completely agree with you Ryan yeah all right cool cool so interesting food for thought okay so if we can proceed to the next slide Okay, let's dig into the weeds here about specific places to search. So uh, a note on the next floor slides, we have chosen a handful of disciplinary areas that have um, the great potential to have interdisciplinary questions within them. Um, and a few notes on the following slides before uh, diving deeper into the resources. So uh, most of the resources uh, you see, we have organized these into three different columns, disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and gray literature. The resources uh, within the interdisciplinary column will probably show up, for the most part, within every single one of these specific disciplinary areas, and that's for obvious reasons that we discussed already. So we also try to indicate uh, the vendor options for the specific platform uh, within parentheses uh, and uh, where you can possibly get access to uh, these specific databases. Um, and finally, most importantly, this is these are not exhaustive lists of, of resources for these specific areas, but we're trying to show that there are some differences in the very specialized resources per discipline that may need to be consulted depending on the nature of your question. So we'll start with psychology and you can see here in the disciplinary resources, we have um, Psych Info, PTSD Pubs, and Pub Psych. Um, so Psych Info is sort of this massive psychology bibliographic literature database developed by the American Psychological Association and is available in a wide variety of vendors, uh, from, from a wide variety of vendors. Uh, PTSD Pubs, which is one I didn't realize or note about, uh, is help, uh, produced through the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. It's freely available. Um, 
It was formerly called Pilots, the published international literature on traumatic stress, and there is a focus on PTSD and other traumatic events within this particular uh, database. Hub Psych uh, is an open access inf information retrieval system of various psychological resources. Uh, it's coordinated by the Leibniz Institute for Psychology Information. So just again, a sampling of that. The interdisciplinary databases, the heavy hitters, if we will, are the Web of Sciences, Scopuses, Dimensions, and uh, dissertations and theses from ProQuest uh, can be, pre be included in here as well. And for psychology, it might be in good, good to also consult the Europe PMC resources as well. Now, where it gets fun is the gray literature resources. And at least for uh, psychology, we've listed here Sci Archive, APA Psych Extra, and Social Sciences Research Network, also called SSRN. Sci Archive is basically a preprint repository of psychological sciences literature. APA Psych Extra is a resource I didn't know about, but the AP has a ton of different databases. And what they basically do is they index a bunch of content from conference proceedings, reports, monographs, and stuff from the psychological perspective that are not otherwise classified or included in other resources. And then SSRN is a very popular preprint and working papers repository for social sciences, business, humanities, uh, and more. So just an overview of psychology. If we could proceed to the next slide, let's take uh, a look at public policy. So some of the disciplinary resources for this are policy file index through ProQuest and policy commons through coherent digital, digital policy file index. They index reports from various think tanks and research organizations and advocacy, advocacy groups with uh, an international coverage perspective. Policy commons uh, provides reports from over 24,000 policy organizations, including small think tanks and municipalities that may not have been captured by other uh, resources. Interdisciplinary resources will most likely be the same for this discipline, but the gray literature resources can include some different options here. We've um, listed the two Godort uh, IGO and NGO custom searches, Google searches, uh, and the Godort is the government documents roundtable of the American Library Association. And what they do is uh, they produce feed-based URLs, or I'm sorry, they feed base URLs of various intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations into a Google search engine so that people can search across all those sites at one time and retrieve possible reports uh, from a very large listing of IGOs and NGOs. There's a long listing of both the base URLs that have been included from a variety of IGO and NGO perspectives that Godort maintains a great resource to potentially consider for this. Likewise, uh, the Harvard Think Tank search searches across uh, public policy institutions and websites that generate research and analysis uh, in, uh, uh, from, the, from the think tank perspective as well. So, okay, that's a sampling of places to consult for public policy. If we switch over to education, uh, real quickly here, the disciplinary resources are at the education collection through ProQuest, which includes both the education database within ProQuest, as well as the education Re resource information center, which is one of the primary places uh, where a lot of research within um, uh, the education space has taken place. It's um, also through the Department of Education within the United States as well. And then there's the education source, fill in the blank resource from EBSCO, uh, Premier, Ultimate. <laughs> there's varying degrees of levels for this particular resource. It's a competitor product uh, to the ProQuest offering. Uh, again, inter interdisciplinary remains the same. And some of the gray literature resources to consider here are the Consortium for Policy Research and Education, which started at Rutgers, but is now a part of the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. Uh, and it's, this is really a community of specialists and researchers uh, from renowned institutions and organizations who are committed to advocating educational policy and practice through evidence-based research. So uh, a number of different white papers possibly and reports from this perspective. The National Education Policy Center, which is run through the School of Education at the University of Colorado in Boulder, contains a variety of publications, including reviews, resource documents, and more that may not be captured in other places. And then last but not least, the Stanford Center for Education Policy Analysis, SEPA, I believe is the acronym for short, is a research center that provides research needed to affect education policy and practice, they contain a working papers repository, which could potentially 
potentially be useful in this area. Okay. My specific area of interest, uh, business and management, and to some degree economics as well. I will throw that in here. So the two primary uh, disciplinary sources are, again, the EBSCO product, business source, fill in the blank, uh, the, the most uh, highest or the largest offering right now, most um, with, with access to the most different reports, journal articles, et cetera, is called Ultimate. So business source Ultimate, but there's also business source Premier, business source Complete, et cetera. The competitor product to that is ABI Inform from ProQuest. There is a new business resource called ProQuest One Business. ProQuest is sort of um, adding additional content and expanding upon some of their offerings at this point in time. Um, so that's possibly one to consider as well, maybe in replacement of ABI Inform. We'll see. Um, and the specific gray literature resources that I wanted to call out again were the SSRN. Uh, working papers are a very big thing in business management and economics, and SSRN is one of the major places where researchers will store a lot of their working papers. The same can be said for the ideas database, which is produced um, uh, by uh, the research division of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, FRED for short. Um, Research papers in economic is another synonymous keyword for this resource, and they contain a bunch of working papers, preprints, journal articles, etc. cetera. Uh, the Ember Working Paper Series, so the National Bureau of Economic Research is another place, as well as the Center for Economic Policy Research, which is an independent, nonpartisan, pan-European nonprofit organization, uh, and they aim to enhance the quality of pub policy decisions by providing policy relevant research from the economic perspective as well. Okay, so that's the where. Uh, just to give you a case study example of, of how uh, this can be done from the business and management perspective, I was lucky to participate uh, in a current systematic review with Denise Rousseau, who is one of the um, uh, uh, main folks, uh, uh, editors, coordinators, if you will, of the business and management uh, coordinating group within Campbell, my colleague, Sarah Young, uh, and a few other researchers on a specific question of interest within the business and management literature. And we did publish a protocol. Our, our systematic review is under review currently. So we're just going to give you an idea of where we actually did our search. So from the disciplinary perspective, we definitely focused on ABI Inform, Business Source Ultimate. We decided to search in the Emerald Management Research Collection, which is uh, a part of the Emerald platform or database, I'm sorry, vendor, <laughs> as well as EconLit. But those proved to not be as um, productive as some of the other ones is, that we thought. So, which is why I possibly didn't quite uh, list them in the preceding slide in the disciplinary resources uh, column. Our interdisciplinary searches included Web of Science Scopus, ProQuest, Dissertations and Theses Global, as well as the DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journal. And where do we go for gray? Because that, if you if you may, a ton of different places. Some of them were already uh, called out and highlighted, uh, but some additional ones were the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System publications. If we applied that thought process into one of the earlier slides about where would possible research be published on this topic, this is sort of a listing of additional places that we came up uh, with. I wanted to pinpoint um, this very specific one, the 2018 American Economic Association Papers and Proceedings Journal. So there's going to possibly be times where you're going to work with a very specific publisher or journal where um, the most current years are not indexed within some of those disciplinary databases that we talked about. So you may actually have to do some specialized searching on the actual public publisher's platform. And this is an example case of that. The AEA has an embargo period with some of their journals. Um, so if we want to get the most recent and relevant information on our, on our topic, it's probably good to search that individual site as well. Uh, a quick note, though, um, the Graylit sources don't yield a lot 
that many additional studies in our particular case, but to be as thorough and systematic as possible, we do want to include them uh, because there were a handful of studies that were captured within them that were not indexed anywhere else. So even though your yield is probably going to be significantly smaller than the disciplinary and interdisciplinary databases, we still want to make sure we're capturing all the possible uh, places where these research will exist. Cosette, if you will proceed to the next slide. Okay, so I just want to do some a little bit of deep diving into some of structuring some of the searches and whatnot. And coming back to our case study example of the protocol we developed, subject headings and thesaurus terms are an important part of search strategy development, but there are slight differences in some of these um, specific databases. Um, Cosette, if you could proceed. So this is a, a subject heading uh, for mergers and acquisitions uh, within the um, Business Source Ultimate Thesaurus uh, in the in the EBSCO uh, platform, and then another example here because that if we would show uh, this is the same exact concept or topic, if you will, subject heading uh, within the ABI Informs ProQuest database offering, um, and so there are slight differences here. Why they do this, I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe to differentiate and possibility, but uh, within business and management. It's usually more common to say mergers and acquisitions or M&A as opposed to A&M. Uh, but in this specific case, we had to account for the differences between the two database offerings in terms of subject headings. So I just wanted to give um, a shout out to that. There's also going to be, this is more so from the disciplinary and interdisciplinary search database perspectives. There's going to be a more structured searching options in these types of resources than the graylet sources. Sometimes the graylet sources, all you have is uh, key, just searching keywords across the entire platform. And then you have to come up with a strategy uh, for all the different possible keywords that might yield potential results. It can be difficult at times. Okay. Let's switch over to keywords specifically here. So disciplinary jargon plays a huge part in keyword development. You must consider individual words and phrases, synonymous keywords, and possibly uh, very popular or accepted acronyms within uh, the disciplinary perspective. However, we must be careful uh, with acronyms because they can lead to noise as well. Here's a few examples to consider. Uh, if the acronym is too general in nature, so example, ML, ML. This could stand for machine learning, meta language, markup language. That may not be the best possible uh, acronym to, to, to include within a search because you're going to generate a lot of noise, especially if it's used within the disciplinary area quite a bit for different things. Uh, a second example is an acronym may have multiple meanings. Um, I came up with this example to give to you, CRT. That can possibly stand for cathode ray tube, critical race theory, cardiac resynchronization therapy. I'm so pumped that I got that word correct. <laughs> That's a very long word. Now, um, the idea here is to show you the possibility of different meanings of, of an acronym. But in that specific use case, those are three distinct different types of acronyms by discipline. So we might be able to control and screen for that in a way where the actual acronym can be used within the search, but just be mindful that there's the possibility uh, of acronyms meaning the same, uh, multiple different things, the same acronym meaning multiple different things. And then sometimes multiple keywords, there will be multiple keywords and acronyms for a particular topic. So to come to our protocol example in, in business and management, we were focused specifically on this uh, part of the question related to firm financial performance and what are the all the different kinds of potential keywords and measurements that can be used to get at that particular topic. And we found out that there were a ton that needed to be included. For example, return on equity, return on asset, uh, ROI, ROIC, and these acronyms, since they are very specific to this disciplinary area, were probably justifiable and, and reasonable to use within our search. And these are just a handful of samplings that could be included. There are a ton of other profit metric keywords um, that can be used. The idea behind this is that the list can get very, 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 very long. Okay, Cosette. Okay, you right. And Ryan, just yes. want to call your attention. We're, we're at about nine minutes left. So, okay, um, I'm going to breeze sure through the rest time. of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Uh, this slide, um, it's just to, to show an example of keywords that different terms can be used across different cultural landscapes. Directors in Western countries and Western businesses do not refer to C-suite level folks, whereas directors in Australia could possibly refer to C-suite level folks. We can breeze past that. That's just a, an, an additional example. This is just a slide to show you how we structured uh, a, a specific search within ABI Inform using subject headings as well as keywords, Cosette if you can. Um, I just wanted to pinpoint here that within business and management literature, you're going to search resources that include trade journal literature. Those are most likely, probably 99% of the time, going to be excluded from search results because they really are not research focused. Um, they are more an industry specific type of publication that's probably not going to be included. Okay, Cosette. Last part of our section, we just talk about norms that conflict with uh, some systematic review expectations. Go ahead, Cosette. Um, from a social sciences perspective, uh, disciplines have established cultural practice. I'm going to focus on business and management. Go ahead, Cosette. Um, publication formats, working papers versus peer-reviewed articles. So although the end result in business and management is to get a peer-reviewed publication, working papers are a very integral uh, portion of the research process, and we want to include them. Go ahead, Cosette. Just a few other uh, types of norms that happen within business and management that conflict a little bit. The expectation to publish in top-rated journals. You'll see this a lot of times within business and management called the A-list journals. The goal is to publish within them. That's reflected in across all of the sub-disciplines in this area as well. That mindset can translate into the search process. A lot of times folks will, will when I'm consulting with them, they'll say, oh, well, we only want to look for research in the AOM publications or the AEA publications. Not a good idea if you're really going to do a true systematic review or evidence synthesis project. Authorship expectations become problematic as well. Uh, in, in, in this particular field, a lot of times individuals are very small teams published. This idea of not having a very large team can ca cause problems. Um, and there is a lot of published ES uh, papers in this specific discipline that, that are calling themselves systematic reviews or scoping reviews, but there really could be um, an increase in methodolo methodological rigor that's applied to these. Some publications uh, and journals are starting to tackle this. For example, the Management Review Quarterly is definitely taking a more systematic and rigorous approach to this. And another potential place where this could be replicated is a publication called the Academy of Management Annals as well. Okay, Cosette, I'll turn it back over to you. Sorry, I talked too much. No, no, I also uh, spoke a lot in the beginning. So thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm just going to go over some other things that might not be specific to the business, business management world, but are also some disciplinary norms and considerations. Uh, again, we're always looking at the research question and the synthesis goals as driving the uh, the approach and those nuanced details. But how articles are curated and made accessible will will vary by field. Uh, so that's going to impact your search approach. Uh, common research methods will impact your risk of bias expectations. Really important to remember, randomized control trials are not appropriate for every research question or feasible in every research uh, endeavor. Um, so we can't be using the same measures for uh, appraisal in that regard. Um, and then we also want to be uh, considering the expectations for transparent reporting. This is especially consider this is especially important for in, in my experience for qualitative research uh, and qualitative evidence synthesis me uh, methods where um, some folks uh, who are really experts in their qualitative uh, fields in their primary research fields uh, will emphasize the ethical considerations of how transparent we need to be um, and the sensitivity of qualitative uh, data and methods um, in sharing with regard to sharing and then uh, something else I didn't add here that I'll just add briefly is uh, the the practical as aspects of sharing and how much you need to share when it comes to qualitative information so that last one can really make it difficult sometimes to have a primary study that is transparently reported to the point that you can use it in your synthesis um, and then of course uh, there are some experience in conduct sort of uh, challenges that are common to interdisciplinary approaches in general um, that I won't go over exhaustively here. We really want to end on the note of, uh, you know, you don't have to do a systematic review in order to do a fantastic, important, and meaningful review. 
Uh, sometimes a literature review is actually the best method for your goals, for your capacity, or even your timeline. Um, I think it's really important to consider the, the importance of a high quality evidence synthesis method uh, and the approach being executed in a high quality manner. Um, we unfortunately do end up seeing, uh, this is a 2017 article calling out the quality of systematic reviews. Um, so about five years old, but this is not something that has completely gone away. So we wanna make sure that we are aligning our capacity to conduct the highly rigorous systematic review uh, and balancing uh, our expectations there. Um, in the same, in a similar vein, uh, there is a 2018 publication kind of calling out this hierarchy uh, between systematic reviews and narrative reviews and the assumption that systematic is always better. Um, I, there is a legitimate challenge to, you know, not, not always, right? It's not always going to be the best approach. Um, and I'll leave you with some ideas of how, if you do want to take a systematic approach, how you might do that um, by looking at the 2019 meeting the review family, uh, Sutton et al. do highlight a number of reviews. 48 different review types and seven different review families. Uh, so you've got a lot of different um, uh, options to consider, but some that I've highlighted here include the rapid review where you're simplifying or omitting certain steps of the systematic review process to uh, adhere to a, time, a shorter time period. You might do a systematic search and review combining the critical review of a comprehensive and a comprehensive search process. You might do something like a systematized review, uh, taking elements of a systematic review process, but not quite uh, meeting that full systematic review method. Um, and then I will also call out Dr. Booth one more time uh, for another fantastic and very important research uh, re resource, uh, the systematic approaches to a, su a successful literature review, um, which again, if you haven't already exposed yourself to these resources, I would highly encourage it. There's a lot of really great material in here. Um, we will also call out the Campbell coordinating groups. If you are planning to publish with the Campbell collaboration, please do know that these groups are here to support you. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to them. And um, we will now conclude maybe a few minutes for, uh, for questions, uh, but we'll thank <laughs> Yashika, Sarah, and Kate so much for your support in, this, uh, in our development of this presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Cosette and Ryan. That was really uh, interesting talk, and I really enjoyed it. hope everyone else did. Um, I think we have maybe time for one very quick question, if there are any. I'll give folks a second to type into chat. Sorry we lied about the time. <laughs> no time flies when you're having fun, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll... Well, since Maybe I'll ask one really quick question. If you have any quick words of advice for folks embarking on possibly a very interdisciplinary topic, I know more and more we're all working at these very interdisciplinary you know, spaces with crossover um, in, in the work. And I wonder if you have any quick words of advice on someone starting on a interdisciplinary systematic review. Yeah, I can, I can just hop in and say my immediate piece of advice is to collaborate. Um, you shouldn't feel like you need to be the expert, uh, the only expert on your team and your, in your, uh, you bring your disciplinary expertise, you might bring methodological expertise, searching expertise, statistics, uh, but, but you, uh, the team effort is there. So if you don't feel comfortable with an aspect, a disciplinary aspect of your review, find someone to collaborate with, if you can. Hey, Cosette that. said the same exact the exact thing I was gonna say. The team, <laughs> the team, the team. That's a that's yes. a football coach quote. I'm a guy. I'm just gonna end with that. I, I would nice. offer the same advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, great way to great way to end the talk and uh to wrap it up. So thank you again both and thank you, Yashika, for sort of being there in the, the background, making things operate smoothly. Um and I will just say we've got um 
a lot of other great uh, webinars lined up for you the rest of the year. I just put the link to the Canva webinar webpage there and definitely feel free to register, take a look at what's there and, and register at those links. Um, again, thank you both and thank you everyone.